Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with me is our first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Josh. Hey, everybody. And sitting next to Christian is Jason Rugg, pushing buttons over there. How's it going, Jason? Good. How are you? Awesome. So today, we want to talk about the filmmaking process we are today. There's a lot to do still, even though at this point, people could watch your film and most people would think, oh, it's done. Yeah, I tell everybody the house has been built, the sod has been laid, the driveway has been poured, uh, the wallpaper is on, but there's still a lot of uh, other little things that need to be done, the interior decorating, like curtains and lamps and furniture and things like that. And so even though the film has been edited for all intents and purposes, you're still in the editing process. Yeah. In fact, you know, we talked last week about me going on this birthday trip and while I'm traveling on that trip, um, after the last one, I felt pretty confident we had the money, you know, all the money kind of came in from our past efforts of fundraising. So I uh, calculated we had $16,000 to work with. So I knew that, you know, the next steps were getting back in the edit booth with Bill and having him to to finish some of the editing stuff. And I set him on that course before I came back. And we decided that we were going to spend this week and whatever we have of next week trying to figure out the edit because we have a huge screening coming up on February 6th. It's a focus group screening still in Arlington Heights. It is going to be unbelievable. We have the French General Council uh, of France to the Midwest, who's going to be there, and some of his team. We have uh, a couple of World War II veterans. We have Dr. Belzikian back, who was the occupation survivor, remembers the liberation. We have Flo Plana is going to be there, and Flavie Poisson and Thomas Voisson are going to be there. They're two of our French reenactors. It's going to be a star-studded event, wow. and so, and I am really trying to convince all of our team to come to that event. So it's sort of like, in my mind, I think that we should be done and have picture locked by February sixth. So picture lock is you you no longer can touch it, no longer change it. Like it's it's as it says locked, and you're done with the editing part of it. Correct. That doesn't mean that we're ready to you know, distribute it immediately, but it does mean that that there are no more changes after that. We're done with changes. We will need to finish our rights and clearances. We will need to possibly switch out some images if we don't get clearances for those. We will need to do color mixing and grading and probably some final score and sound work. But for the all intents and purposes, the story and the picture is done. And we are so close now in this last version. The feedback that we have received are things that we're trying to address. One, there feel like there feels like there are multiple endings. We need to address that because we do agree with that. You think it's going to end and then it doesn't. You think it's going to end again and it doesn't. I am wholly absent in Act 2. There's a long section in the first, you know, after the first 20 minutes, 20 minutes into, um, you know, the first hour of the film, I don't narrate anything. It's all the French people talking, and it's all the hard stories of their loss. And we've gotten a lot of feedback that people need just a little bit of a break. Uh, you know, they need to breathe a little bit, and they, I need to just not disappear. I kind of need to be a constant breathe presence. Breathe as in reading is too much for them? or I think it's both. I think it there is a lot of reading in that section, but it's also so heavy. They're processing oh, stories see. after story after story after story. And you when the narrator comes in, she gives you a little bit of a rest. Right. You yeah. can catch your breath. You can process what you've just heard. So um, editing is a lot about pacing and rhythm and just kind of the, the feel and flow where, like, for example, if the audience is feeling like, man, this section feels weighted down, heavy, too much, then – it's almost like, uh, I don't know, a bottleneck or it's like the river's just not flowing the way it should. And that's where editing can fix it, right? Yeah, and it's been interesting to me. I think I've watched this with an audience almost close to 30 times now. And 
part of making a film, I find these focus group screenings to be crucial because you're sitting in an audience. You're not necessarily looking at the content, but you are watching your audience watch the film. But you also feel this invisible energy. And I can tell when it, it, I'm a stage actress by training, and there's just something you know when you've got the audience, you feel that they're with you, um, or when they're not. But I can sense when they're getting a little bit fatigued with what they're listening to, or they're wiggling in their seats, or they um, seem a little bit more distracted, or they are too overwhelmed with emotion. You know, it's these focus group screenings have been my eyes watching what people are actually doing, how they're receiving the film, listening to their focus group comments afterwards. And as I've done that, I realized that you are taking people on an emotional journey and you need to be thinking about how they're processing that. Is it too much? Is it just enough? And we have found the formula that we figured out, which is you open up with hope and this new exciting idea and a question. You dive into the difficult, hard part of it. We realized that we needed to bring levity somewhere. You can give people that kind of a break and give them something to laugh about. And so that humor piece has been important. And then there is giving of the information, but there's also like heart-wrenching message of the film, which is really tear-inducing. Right. But if you if you don't balance all that out and put the ingredients in the right amounts, it it makes it throws off the recipe. Yeah. So since I've never been to film school, um, <laughs> since this whole thing is trial by fire, um, I've had to figure that formula out with this film, with these types of audiences. And so that's where we are right now, taking in all of that verbal feedback, written feedback, and our own experience of watching our audiences and figuring out a way to improve it even more, make it make that recipe and that formula more balanced. Have you discussed or thought about, or maybe you've explored this, you know, getting uh, a professional who has not seen this as much as you and Bill and say, hey, can you, you know, fresh eyes, you're a professional editor or filmmaker of some type, take a look at it. And, you know, what's your first knee-jerk reaction when you see this? And have you done that? I do or? it all the time. Oh, you do? <laughs> I, I do it all the time. Yeah, because I'm always – I always want to seek out people that know more than me. So I have paid consultants to work on our film. I've given consultants credit. Um, in a, you know, so, yes, I do it actually – often because I want their feedback to see what works, what doesn't. What we've done this week is our my co-writer, Julie Danis, she has, I think, only sat in an audience for maybe two or three screenings, and she hasn't watched this each cut as much as I have. So we really wanted her to watch it and weigh in with her notes, and that's been really good because she is a writer. She's a like more of a technical writer than I am and she can go through and give us a little pushback on each different thing um, those are fresh eyes in the script writing department I have given them to uh, people in the industry uh, Michael Kaplan is one of them uh, Nicole Bernardi Reyes is another one who've not watched it very much but yet have been in this business no documentaries far better than I do and so our revisions are also based on their feedback because it seems like you'd have to juggle and balance your own thoughts, uh, the audience, who is you got to listen to what they say. But at the same time, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and be like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so let me give you an example. I mean, that's absolutely true. You have to look at the person that's giving you advice, and you have to put them in their context. So um, there is a person in France who feels like – this film has too much about St. Mary Glees, and it should really have a lot more about St. Marie Dumont. And they'll give us notes, but they're all geared with trying to elevate St. Marie Dumont and, you know, mm. lessen the impact of St. Mary Glees. Well, we realize that they come to the table with that sort of bias, right. you know. And so while they may have good comments about some things, we have to take their bias into consideration as we're making our notes. Um, 
and one person may be giving us notes and maybe their expertise is script writing and the other one, their expertise is distribution. You know, you just have to know that everybody is giving you advice based on their own frame of reference. Yeah. And yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated thing to balance all of those things <laughs> as you're making these cuts and revisions. And it comes down to, in the end, you knowing your story, you believing what you're telling, and you have to make decisions in the end knowing that not everyone is going to be happy. Right. I've learned this last time. There are left-brained people who are not like me, right. who are not emotional like I am, and I am not their cup of tea. I, <laughs> they do not like how I write, and that's not doesn't mean that I should go crawl in a shed, but it, it does mean that some people are going to like what I do, and yeah. some people are not, right. and that's going to be okay. I can't please everybody. And then as far as having the deadline, uh, February, was it? Six. Six. Um, that was based on the screening of Arlington Heights, right? It was, and that came about because our French um, guest of honor could only come on that day. Mm-hmm. So it was it dictated by when people could be there. And I do think that – my hope is that we will have pretty much things locked up by the first or second week of January in terms of our story being told. Bill and I sort of have marching orders for different things that we need to get accomplished in that time. That you and Bill came up with, right? Well, taken into everybody, you know, taking everybody's critiques into consideration. What I'm saying is like the, 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 the time frame. Yes. I had, to, I had to back time from February 6th. Yeah. So I know if we're going to change the score, which we're going to need to, and change some of the sound effects and do color mixing and grading and make a DCP file <laughs> in order for the theater to play it, I've got all that back timed. Because really, it doesn't have to be done by February 6th. You could just say, oh, we'll have a version done by February True. 6th. And so True. you're making a, a, a producer call here. Like I we, am. We're, we're going to be picture lock February 6th. And what I had to do with my team was say, okay, guys, I know this is almost an unrealistic goal. We have this goal. It would be phenomenal if we could get the film locked and finished by then. Is everybody on board with making this goal? Because this is Christmas. It's New Year's. There's a lot going on. Are you interested in pushing this hard right now to make this deadline? And everybody on the team agreed that they were. So we're going to shoot for that goal, and we have sort of a backup plan if it doesn't work. So... Hopefully, we'll, we'll just see how it goes. We're going to push for it, and if we don't make it, that's not the end of the world. So February 6th is the deadline, and when's the screening for Arlington Heights? The screening for Arlington Heights is uh, February 6th. Oh, it is February? Oh, yes. It's- so the screening is February 6th, so the deadline to have it done is like two weeks before. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. All right. And then um, we also have one January 12th in Wheaton, Illinois, at the library. At the library. That <laughs> one's kind of out of my hands. The library just wants me to show up and show the film. And they're running, you know, the reservations and whatever. We're going to have reenactors there, though. And oh, cool. some local people are going to be there, like Josh Lindsay. My neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so that's January 12th. And then we're still raising funds. Funds, just in case you want to know, um, we've raised, we've gotten sixteen thousand dollars, but we do still need more um, to pay the colorist and to pay for archival stuff. And yeah, so if you're able to uh, spare any change to help us finish this, get it across the finish line, we would greatly appreciate even it. Even a crumpled five dollar bill. Even a crumpled five dollar bill. Sometimes those are the most meaningful. Well, hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell, and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to Documentary First. We really appreciate your partnership with us. We can't do any of this without you. So thank you so much for listening, for donating, and for following along on our journey. If you are able to make a donation this week, we really would appreciate it. We are supported by donors who give us $100 or less, so anything helps. Also, if you're able to share the news about the girl who wore freedom with your friends and family, please do that on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or email, and sign up for our newsletter at Normandy Store. Please go to normandystories.com slash donate to make a donation today.